Welcome back to What the Flight Radio, a podcast for in-flight crew, frequent flyers, and anyone that gives a about aviation and travel. How are we feeling today, flight family? I hope you are all enjoying these hot summer nights, time with your family, grinding at work or with your side hustles, whatever it may be that brings you joy. I really hope that you are doing just that. Now, if you're new here, hello, hi, hola. My name is Jess. I'm a flight attendant for a major U.S. airline. And on this podcast, we talk about all things aviation and travel. We talk about flight attendant lifestyle and career, packing tips, solo travel adventures, advice on different areas of travel. And we're just starting out, believe it or not. So there's going to be so much more once I actually start bringing some guests on the show as well. So that's going to be really exciting. So I really hope you decide to stick it out and be a frequent flyer with me for What the Flight Radio. Thank you so, 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 so much for tuning into my podcast and taking a listen to it today. And if you're one of my returning listeners, thank you so much for your loyalty to this show. I am so happy that you're all here. So before we take flight, I want to let you know that this podcast is brought to you in part by Living by the F Word, which is my brand. If you're into flying, festivals, fashion, food, fitness, fine art, and you live your life with the fulfill it yourself mentality, then you are in fact living by the F word with me. Feel free to be my friend on social media with the social links that are listed in the show notes of this podcast. You can follow me at WT Flight Radio, or you could follow me at living by the F word. And yeah, I would love to be your friend and connect with you. Now, for those of you that are weekly listeners but are not connected with me on social media, you might be wondering where last week's episode is or where what happened to it. Well, I actually announced last week on my Instagram accounts, yeah, go follow me there, uh, that I was taking a break from the podcast simply because the time I had blocked out to record that week's episode was rudely interrupted by a seven hour flight delay, which honestly was was just insane. So yeah, I just feel like the last week or so has been totally insane for me. And yeah, let me catch you up to speed with all of that and what's been going on in my life before we reach our cruising altitude. So in case you missed it, two weeks ago, I released episode number eight, how to avoid burnout and recover from jet lag, because I was really feeling the effects of consistent travel again, especially with summer flying. And if you don't know what summer flying means, it just basically means, think about it, it's when everyone's going on vacation. The weather is warm here in North America. So summer flying, it just means it's busy. And then also other people are wanting to take vacation at work. So you're just, you know, it's just busy is the best way to explain it. But basically coupled with all of that, running a YouTube channel, this podcast, Instagram accounts for both, giving my puppy walks and playtime. I'm trying to work out again on my layovers, you know, the whole shebang, you know, just doing it all. You know what I mean? And if you know, you know, adulting just gets busy and there's times where it just feels like time is literally flying by. Don't you agree? So yeah, it's just been really busy. I feel like I'm saying that in every episode, but it's just the truth. Um, so I actually recorded and edited and uploaded that particular episode all on the Wednesday it was released, which of course was super last minute. Even right now I'm recording the day before this one's going to be released. So I'm definitely having trouble getting caught up and I'm definitely feeling like it's very challenging for me to manage all of this is how I really truthfully feel. Uh, but we're just doing our best and yeah, that's what matters, right? All right. So the day after that episode was released, I brought my puppy Kia to get spayed, which as a first time puppy owner was so difficult, especially picking her up. And she was crying the whole way home. And I just felt so terrible. And I felt so sad. Um, But you know, don't worry, because literally the next day, she was like perfectly fine. And she is so high energy, like, so 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 high energy like her main breeds are boxer pomeranian and australian cattle dog and so like basically that's like 70 percent of what she is she's a bunch of other stuff too she's a total mutt but basically she's very high energy dog so to keep her crate rested and not 
take her on walks and, you know, let her run in my big backyard was like really challenging for me and my family. Um, trying to limit her movement and all that, obviously. So, uh, yeah, that was like the day after that. And then after that, um, or actually like during that, when she, you guys are probably wondering, well, well, why didn't you record while she was having surgery? And the reason being was because I actually batch recorded some YouTube videos because there was some YouTube content that I wanted to release that I've been wanting to release like for the month of June. And now it's like the end of July and I'm still trying to record and edit all that for YouTube. So I just feel like I seriously haven't had the time to get around to any of the YouTube content I wanted to do. And so I batch recorded some stuff while she was gone. And then after she came home the following day, I was pretty much doing stuff around my house and packing so I could fly out to a show in LA on Saturday. So Saturday I flew out to Los Angeles for a Cascade show And for anyone that is tuning in that doesn't know who Cascade is, he's basically an electronic dance music DJ. And I really credit him for getting me into house music and really credit him into kind of like, I really started going to a lot of like festivals and stuff after getting into his music. And so actually a lot of my solo travel is revolved around festivals too. So anyway, he's just like one of my favorite artists. Um, so it was very like nostalgic for me cause I haven't seen one of his shows in a long time, but basically I've gone to a lot of his shows. I've seen a lot of his album tours. I've seen him at ultra Tomorrowland, basically any major festival he's been at. I've seen him do massive events and now he was doing this massive show at the newly built SoFi Stadium. So I flew out for one night for that show and the blog, the blog, the vlog video obviously of that experience is live on my YouTube channel. So you can go ahead and visit youtube.com forward slash living by the F word to watch that. And don't forget to subscribe over there, friends. I'm getting close to 500 subscribers, which is so exciting. I have a separate YouTube channel for obviously my brand living by the F word and for this podcast as well. And once I reach 100 subscribers on my podcast channel, What the Flight Radio, I am going to do a giveaway there. I keep bringing it up, but I've kind of been like stagnant at 17 subscribers. So if you're tuning in on a platform, go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel too. And I'll do a giveaway once I hit Uh, reach 100 subscribers. But anyway, um, basically after Cascade, this is where the irregular operations occurred. So I was supposed to be on the first morning flight from Los Angeles to Newark. I got notice that my flight was delayed like an hour. And that was like no big deal because it was just an hour. I'll still land at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I could drive home, be home by six. I'll repack for work, record the podcast. I'll start my work trip. And the next day, I will edit the podcast on my layover Tuesday night for the Wednesday Wednesday release. Well, that was what I had planned, but that did not happen. The flight ultimately went on a rolling delay, which is where they basically delay it. And it, they have an estimated time, but then they keep adding more and more time. And the delay just keeps going on and on and on and on for hours. But this is probably one of the longest rolling delays I've ever had. The fact that it was seven hours delay was like really pretty crazy. Um, And if you're wondering what that delay was for, it was because the aircraft that we were on the night prior when it arrived, one of the crew members, quote unquote, blew a slide. So what that means is an emergency slide that should only be deployed when there's an emergency was activated by mistake. So it's a very, very big no-no in the industry, and it's actually such a crucial part of the flight attendant job. A lot of people don't realize that, but basically to arm and disarm doors, which I will definitely talk about in another episode um, because there's just so much to cover on this podcast, but Anyway, I tried to get on other flights, but many of the other flights with my carrier, they were delayed or canceled. And then I tried to get on other airlines, but they were diverting or they had already left. So I basically just felt stranded. And so I didn't land back in New Jersey until 1130 p.m. on Sunday night. 
I didn't get home until 12.30 a.m., like going into Monday morning. My puppy was, of course, all excited to see me. So I was up with her, and then I was repacking my bags for a four-day work trip. And then I woke up at 6.30 a.m., and I went on that four-day work trip. So I was on minimal sleep, obviously. And yeah, I just couldn't get the episode out. Basically, that's what I'm getting at. This was basically my whole last week um, and, uh, and why I didn't get the episode out. But instead of stressing myself out, for the deadline or trying to upload it late, I just decided, you know what, fuck it. I'm skipping it this week, especially after releasing an episode all about burnout. I just felt like it was the best thing for me mentally and physically to take a break, Uh, especially because work in itself has just been like completely exhausting. And yeah, I mean, there's been some very, very long days at work recently. So I was just tired, you know, so straight up, that is the truth as to why last week's episode didn't come out, but we are back. And in today's episode, we are going to be talking about five reasons why you should solo travel. Now, let me tell you something. I can come up with a lot more reasons as to why you should solo travel, but at five, it just seems like a nice solid number to get you started. And like I said, I kind of want to keep some of these episodes a little shorter so I bet you that whole intro is going to be longer than the, the whole episode, but I could always elaborate on more of these points in future episodes. If there's something I mention that I want to elaborate on more in further detail or that you want me to elaborate on, I'm sure at some point I will come up with a whole separate episode for some of these topics. And yeah, if there's something actually that you're in particular interested about, like me like covering more go ahead and email me my email is radio at living by the f word.com once again the email is radio at living by the f word.com so of course this episode is going to be very like I said nostalgic for me and fun because solo travel personally changed my life for the better um I'm just looking really forward to inspiring any listeners out there that feel hesitant to go solo somewhere anywhere solo Okay, it doesn't matter if it's a new city, a concert, a festival, whatever. Solo travel really has worked some wonders for me. And so I'm really happy to share and inspire with five reasons why. But of course, before we get into all the warm and fuzzy, feel good stuff about solo travel, let me give you this week's aviation lingo for the week. If you're new to the podcast, this is probably my favorite segment where I tell you about an aviation lingo term or expression and explain what it means. So it's really educational segment, especially if you are not within the aviation industry, or if you are someone that is wanting to be a part of the aviation industry, or just wanting to learn more, I find this segment to be very useful. And I hope you do too. This week's aviation lingo is commuter. So this was something that honestly blew my mind when I became a flight attendant. I honestly had no idea this was even a possibility. Uh, When I came into the industry, I was very like unaware. So I work for a mainline carrier, but I had never been a part of the industry before. So everything was very new to me. So basically a commuter is a flight attendant who... Well, not only just a flight attendant, it could be a flight attendant or a pilot that basically flies to work. Yes, actually flies to work. So to give you an example, I live in New Jersey. I am based in the New York City metropolitan area. I drive to work, but I am not considered a commuter because I actually live in base. So I live where I'm based. I fly out of where I'm based. And commuters in the aviation industry, they fly from wherever they live into whatever base they operate their trips out of. So I guess this could be one of the pros of the job is that we could basically live wherever we want because we can just fly to work. And trust me, people do. When I say that people commute, and I'm not talking about short leg commutes, we are talking about commuters that are basically next level crazy. (laughs) Um, There are people in my base alone that commute from the West Coast, and I'm based, obviously, like I said, by New York City, right? So there's people that commute from Europe, South America, basically anywhere. And there are people that live in the country that do double commutes, which basically means they take two flights to get to their base, and then they fly all day. So typically, commuters will fly into the base 
with like for that morning, they'll try to fly in in a morning and they usually have like a later trip in the afternoon that starts later in the day and then they'll fly their trip. And then when they're done, they'll either fly back home or they'll go to their crash pad. And crash pad was episode eight's aviation lingo and crash pads are super crucial if you're a commuter. So that's why I'm kind of doing those two terms back to back. But, um, you know, I have heard of all sorts of commuting stories. People commute from Hawaii to the mainland. People live in Canada and commute to the United States. You name it. People do it. And it's just so fascinating to me. It's really mind blowing, in my opinion. Um, I personally have been toying with the idea of relocating in a couple years when my mother retires and moves. And I'm thinking of relocating. But, and there's the big, big, big but, I am very, very, very torn on the matter because commuting is not easy. Because when you are a commuter, you are flying standby. So it's not like it's a guaranteed seat for you to get to work. Unless there's some type of natural disaster, like a hurricane or a storm, then usually the company will fly you in on a seat that is guaranteed so that you could operate your trips. But for the most part, You are flying standby, uh, which means like it goes by however their standby list goes in seniority order, depending on what airline you're trying to get on. And I just think that it could be extremely stressful, especially with situations even like what just happened last week. I was trying to commute back from California, basically, so that I could be in place to operate my trip on Monday. And that seven hour delay happened. And the more and more it kept happening, I was like, man, like I'm getting going to get home so late now and I'm going to have like no sleep. Is it really safe for me to operate this trip? You know what I mean? It was getting to that point. And luckily I got a seat on that flight and got to sleep on the flight home. But there's things like that where I think it would just be absolutely completely stressful. And depending on the airline you work for, there are what's called like commuter policies that will cover you if something happens when you're trying to commute into work. But for the most part, I just feel like it's an added stress when you commute. And I personally just don't know if I can handle it knowing my personality type. So yeah, something just to think about, I guess. And, you know, other things to think about is, You know, when the days get really long and you're being pushed to your max hours, which in this industry is a lot, and you could become very tiresome, but I don't know. It's just like one of those things like I've been about a lot lately. I'm like, ooh, I really kind of want to like live somewhere else. I have the luxury of living somewhere else and flying to work. But then there's this like I hear these horror stories about trying to get to work. And like I am tired when I have long days and I have to drive 30 minutes home so I can't even imagine like then trying to wait for a flight and then that flight your commuter flight is delayed and you don't get home and then you have to actually drive home from that airport once you get home it just seems like it's so much added um work (laughs) um but of course you do have the option of transferring bases and living elsewhere. So there's always that option. There's just like a lot of flexibility and options when you fly for a living, which is what the cool part is. And I just personally don't know if I want to give up the base that I fly out of, though. That's like the problem. I'm like one of those people where I'm like, what if I don't, what if I transfer out and then I can't transfer back in type of thing? You know, I just feel like it would be, I don't know man, I sound like I'm really scared. I'm not even like, I don't even have a base transfer in. I don't even have like a home or anywhere to move to. But like, um, this has like really been on my mind lately, which is another reason why I wanted commuter to be the aviation lingo. Um, so yeah, just lots to think about, um, especially if you are trying to have aviation as a career. Everyone is different. Some people see commuting as an easy peasy type thing. Others, not so much. And I just feel like living in base is really, really beneficial, especially if you're just starting off. Um, All right. Well, the main cabin door has been closed on this segment. Let's take flight into this episode. Welcome to episode nine, five reasons why you should solo travel. So, 
First of all, let me just say, you guys, once again, I'm recording this episode and my puppy has been so good all day, sleeping all day. And I, of course, like was not ready. I couldn't get my shit together. I'm finally ready. And she was barking before. And now my camera battery is dying for the YouTube footage if you're watching on YouTube. So, man, I swear one day I'll get it right. Anyone that's tuning in, I know you probably won't ever be able to tell because the editing obviously when you're just listening on a podcast platform and you're just streaming audio you can't tell but for the people on YouTube you might be noticing all the choppiness of the editing but anyway I'm really happy to be talking about solo traveling today of course as I mentioned before solo traveling was a life-changing experience for me and after my first solo trip I could not stop it basically was like an addiction I just could not stop traveling and even now eight years later I solo travel but I don't ever feel alone because I feel like I know so many people that I meet up with through traveling that it's just become like a snowball effect. It just like one thing leads to another, if that makes sense. And I know that in episode one of this podcast, which was titled My Aviation Story, Solo Travel Festivals, Flight Attendant Life, I talked about it briefly a little bit on that episode. And I also did a full video on my YouTube channel titled How Raving and Solo Travel Changed My Life. And I talked about it there. And yeah, basically my first solo trip led to more and more connections and more and more experiences. And I basically even created like a mind note map, which is like a tool you can basically link connections or ideas. It's really meant for brainstorming ideas. But I actually created it with, okay, this connection and this festival led to this connection and this festival, which led to this travel trip and this travel trip. And it's really impressive, like the amount of people I have met over the years by solo traveling. And there was a lot of people that weren't even mentioned on those episodes and on those videos. So it's just really crazy to even think about. All right. So let's dive into the best reasons why You yourself should solo travel. I have five reasons. Of course, like I said in the intro, I could probably go on way more than five. There's way more than five reasons, but I kind of want to keep it simple. So I felt like five was a really good number to start you guys off. So number one, and probably the best and most important reason is you are on your own agenda. You guys, I can't even... Uh, like explain how good it felt my first solo trip which was to Miami for ultra music festival I stayed in a hostel I met tons of people Um, my sorority sister Jackie and her friends were there they were staying somewhere else and just like being able to meet up with her when I wanted to go out with the people from my hostel when I wanted to go out with different people that I had met when I wanted to sleep when I wanted to it was just like it was the first time I had ever experienced where I wasn't traveling with someone and it was like okay well we have to go here because you know I really wanted to go here or you know really anywhere even like at festivals like when you travel with a group like well we want to see this person at nine o'clock well I want to see this person at nine o'clock and then people like tend to not want to split from one another and there's like all these things that happen when you travel with a group of people And I even just mentioned it like this last weekend, like I'm really grateful that I had friends that were there to pick me up in California and go out with in California. And also like I stayed at my friend's house while I was waiting for my friends to pick me up. But like there was like kind of this like hectic hecticness about it where this person wanted to go to the beach and this person just wanted to have lunch local. And then this person will you know, you need to be here at this time because, you know, this person has work. And, you know, it was just like too much of that. And so that's why with solo travel, when you're on your own agenda, you have the freedom to wake up when you want to go where you want to stay where you want to leave when you want to meet who you want to, you know, food, sightseeing, all of it. It's on your own terms. There's no disagreements. There's no waiting on others. And there's also, you know, the reverse. There's no one that is rushing you. If you're the one that is usually running behind, that takes your time to get ready. You know, there's no one like, come on, come on. We were supposed to leave things like that. It's so, I don't know, like freeing just to like do 
what you want, when you want, and not have to like collaborate with someone else as to when you're going, what you're wearing, what, I don't know. It's just like the best. I just don't even know how to explain it. Now, of course, like there's some cons where if you are solo traveling and, you know, on your, on your own agenda, uh, sometimes like maybe you don't know where to go. And maybe if you were with someone else, they would, they would kind of have an idea of, you know, what is good, but that is, that is going to be like mentioned later on in another point of like networking. Eventually, like you basically, you, you do meet people when you're solo traveling. Uh, the whole point of this first point though, is being on your own agenda and just doing what, whatever the fuck you want basically is the point. Number one, let's get into number two. Number two is you gain confidence, confidence everywhere. Um, you have to make decisions, right? So your your decision making because now you have to decide where you want to go, when you want to go. You're mapping out your day. You're deciding on what activities you might want to do in a foreign country, what sites you want to see. You are taking public transportation and you are walking around unknown territory, which for a lot of people I think is the most scariest part about solo traveling. But it really does help you gain confidence because you kind of have to figure things out on your own. You have to, you know, it makes you ask people things. It makes you want to interact with other people, with the locals and and so forth. And so I really do feel like you gain confidence and you can then bring that confidence back with you into your workplace or with your friends and then you can kind of be like the leader of your group when you do go out with your friends back home or whatever. I just feel like one of the best things is getting over that fear and getting on that plane by yourself. I I remember there was a lot of times traveling alone where I'm like, man, am I like out of my fucking mind for doing this? You know, like it really, sometimes you like think like, am I crazy? But then you just like, you're like, no, because like I keep having amazing times. Everything is so much fun. And yeah, you gain that confidence to keep doing it again and again. And you just keep getting better and better. The more that you do it, you learn, you grow and yeah, I don't really know how else to explain it better besides you kind of become like a whole new you. And it's really important to be confident in today's society and with with a lot of things, with uh, socialization and and even like if you're traveling within your own country and it's somewhere new, I think it's super important to to have that confidence. So I'll probably go into another episode about like tips to stay safe too. But, um, I think like traveling alone in another country or another city that you don't really know is also like kind of nerve wracking for some people. But, um, as long as you stay safe, like one of my tips is, uh, if you're going to be going to another city that you're not aware of, like even when I go into New York city, which is basically my city that I've grew, grown up around my whole life, but I still don't know it that well. You know what I mean? Like I definitely am still like a tourist when it comes to being in New York, but it's really important to kind of like lay out where you're trying to go before you actually go and don't make it visually. Don't make yourself a visual target to people. Like don't have a map out on a bus or a subway, like a big map, or don't be like, you know, having your phone on a map like on a speaker phone so people know you're like listening to instructions. You know what I mean? Try to like own it as if you've been there before and try to own it as if you know where you're going. So if like some stranger even asks you where you're going, just be like, yeah, I know where I'm going. I'm waiting for a friend or something like that. Like you just don't ever want to like come across as like a target. You know what I mean? And so I think that's another way that you gain confidence is if you just like act like you know what you're doing. So I'll probably do a whole other episode on like tips for safety when solo traveling and stuff like that. Like I don't want to get too off topic, but yes, point number two, you gain confidence. All right, moving on to number three, which is like honestly one of my favorite parts and probably what has made solo traveling so like addictive for me. And that is number three is the networking and connections. 
I cannot stress this enough. I feel like for me, this is something that was so life changing for me because you start out being alone, but then the more places and events you go to, you're more willing to meet people and form connections in different cities and countries. And yeah, I've touched upon this on my video of how raving and solo travel changed my life on YouTube when I mind mapped or mind noted map what I was talking about before with all the connections. I didn't even get to really mention all the connections, but like just to give you an example, um, you know, I've met people in hostels all over the world and stayed connected with them so that if I ever travel to their city or they ever travel to my city, I can then link up with them. I met randomly this guy that was carrying a totem at Tomorrowland. I ended up staying with him and his friends in Budapest. He really didn't speak that much English. He still, he picked me up from the airport. We communicated through Google Translate or through his friends that spoke better English. But things like that happened because of solo traveling and networking while traveling solo. So it's just really like mind blowing to me, like the connections you make, people don't realize that it's like a trade off. Once you start meeting these people, you then have a place to stay in other cities, just like people that were gonna travel here anyone that I've ever hosted, you know, hey, I'm not that far from New York City, then you can come stay with me, that type of thing. So the network is just kind of like endless. And I feel like staying at hostels or visiting hostels is a sure way to meet people. So if you are solo traveling, hostels are basically budget accommodations. And they're kind of like dormitory, dormitory style accommodations where there's bunk beds in certain different rooms. Um, you could have all female rooms. You could have mixed rooms with males and females. So it kind of just depends on your budget. Usually the more people it is, and if it's a mixed room, it's usually more expensive, or not more expensive, it's least expensive. And the smaller amount of people, it gets more expensive. Um, even if they even have private rooms, stuff like that. But even if you're not staying in a hostel, say you're staying in an Airbnb with your friends, but you're like, let's meet some people. Go to the hostel bar. There are so many hostels that just have bars and you could go to their happy hour. It's super cheap. And then you meet people that are traveling. Most of the people that are traveling at hostels are traveling alone and want to meet people. And then you just form these connections. You know what I mean? So hostels have been a big win in my solo travel journeys. And I definitely highly recommend it. And I want to do a whole episode on hostels and couch surfing and all that type of stuff like the the kind of like a versus episode of hostels versus hotels versus airbnbs because if say you decide even you and your bestie want to plan a trip and you guys go and get an airbnb you're isolated you know what i mean you're not really going to meet people i've met so many people in hostels i've met couples i've met solo people i've met older generation, younger generation. Um, some hostels have age limits, some don't. So I've met some really interesting people and still stay connected with them on Facebook. I've met people in all different countries. I'm telling you, like the list goes on and on. Um, the network's just amazing when you solo travel. And same goes for festival groups. If you're any of my friends that are listening that are festival goers, I do have several festival goers that listen to this because I my YouTube channel focuses a lot on F words and festivals is one of those F words. And everyone knows I've been a huge festival addict for a long time. And so I've gone to festivals alone too. And typically you can meet some people that are really willing to adopt you into their group because they know that you're alone. So once people find out that you're alone, they're like, oh, well, this is our rape family. This is our festival group. Like, and they introduce you to everyone and then you meet even more people. Um, and so I guess my whole point of the whole networking and all that is somehow you travel alone, but then you're really not alone. Like you really end up not being alone. Like that's how I feel. Like after all these years, I feel like I'm not ever alone even if I'm going somewhere alone I feel like I know all these people now that I don't ever feel alone you know what I mean all right point number four this is another pretty big one obviously I picked the, the top five that I feel like are like most important when you solo travel self-discovery oh this is like I just think so important and so many people are so nervous to solo travel number one because they're afraid to be alone okay there are so many people out there that are just afraid to be alone 
And so you, there's this sense of like solitude when you travel alone. You find comfort in being alone. You learn how to be alone so that you don't constantly need to be with someone. Um, you learn about yourself. You learn so much about yourself. You learn about what really makes you happy, what makes you angry, what gets you frustrated. Like you just kind of have to figure out so many things on your own. If you miss a train, if you, you know, get on the wrong bus the wrong way, there's so many things that happen because you don't have someone else there helping you with directions or whatever. There's a lot of things that could happen and you just really learn a lot. So you learn a lot about different places and really about yourself. You are also very much alone with your thoughts a lot. So there's just so many times where you're in an airport, on a bus alone, in a plane alone, watching a sunset alone, watching the sunrise alone. I mean, I know I just talked about point number three was like the network and the connections and you're not really ever alone, but there are definitely times where you're alone. You know what I mean? So there's just like these scenarios where you are really very much alo like alone with your thoughts. And sometimes you really find answers to things that you felt stumped on. So, you know, Maybe you were debating about something and then you have all this time alone to think about it and you get inspired by this trip and like this answer comes to you about whatever you were debating about, if that makes sense. Um, the last point I have for the self-discovery is you kind of seem to have more time to enjoy living in the moment. I feel like because of all this self-discovery and, you know, being alone, you you really just appreciate like the little things and you also start to appreciate the things back at home, like your family and your friends. And, um, but there's just like these really great moments where you actually feel like you're very present. And so, yeah, those are just some points as far as self-discovery, being alone, being comfortable in your own skin type of thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, really awesome <laughs> my eyes just lit up on YouTube like it just like thinking about all this is just like really really makes me happy all right point number five you will for sure catch the travel bug I'm telling you after I feel like anyone that has solo traveled it has got them fucking hooked like I just feel like anyone I've ever talked to or any other type of travel podcast you listen to you hear about someone that went on a solo travel trip and it just made them keep going, keep going, keep going. And I really do firmly believe that. I feel like you become travel obsessed because you're learning about other cultures, you're trying new foods, you're buying fashion, jewelry, you're on your own agenda. Everything that I just mentioned, like you're meeting all these people and then you make plans to meet all those people in another country you know, that you've never been to. And it, you just like have this adrenaline rush, like, Ooh, this is so sick. Like, this is awesome. This is so fun. And the more places you go, the more people you want to meet. And then the more addicted you become and like you for sure, for sure catch the travel bug. And I think I even spoke on that on episode one, how the first country I ever went to abroad was China for a summer abroad program in 2008 but I didn't really get the travel bug from that trip. I mean, I loved it. I loved the food. I loved the culture. I loved the architecture. I loved everything about that trip, but it didn't make me be like, I need to keep traveling. And the reason was because it was a guided group tour with my school and my puppy's about to head over to say hello to everyone. <coughs> Don't you say hello to the podcast? I'm not even going to edit this out probably. It's okay. I'm almost done. <coughs> oh, yes. I'm almost done. Tell the peoples. She's like looking at the camera like, what is that thing? With that being said, let's, <laughs> with that being said, let's get into aviation news. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, I'm going to get into aviation news right now. I get so thrown off when she comes and barks at me, but <coughs> let's get into it. Okay, let's dive into aviation news. I feel like that was very cut off, so I apologize. I could definitely, 
elaborate more on those points, but I hope you enjoyed the five points of why you should solo travel. Let's get into the aviation news for this week. So first off, there are a lot of regional airlines within the United States that are currently accepting applications. You have GoJet, SkyWest, Air Wisconsin, Endeavor Air, Envoy, Mesa Air, PSA Airlines, Petamont, Republic Airlines, Silver Airways. That's a lot of airlines regionally that are hiring right now. And I think why there's such a market for that is because the mainline carriers that are partners with some of these regional carriers, like so for instance, American, United, and Delta, a lot of these regional carriers fly for them. And it keeps them, it keeps the network connected for the smaller hubs to their main hubs, if that makes sense. So lots of hiring going on. You also have some budget airlines that are currently accepting applications. Allegiant Air, uh, Avello, Breeze Airways, Frontier, and Spirit, and Sun Country. So if you're looking for a flight attendant career, those are some Airlines that are currently hiring for flight attendants, but if you are holding out for mainline or legacy airlines such as United, American, Delta, Alaska, or Hawaiian, my guess would be check back in the fall, fall of 2021. I would check back then for applications. I do think that the mainline carriers are going to be flying again. I just think that at this point, they don't really know when they're going to get there. All right, up next, as far as aviation news, we have United Airlines flight evacuated after teenager airdropped a photo of an airlift gun to other passengers. So airdropping, I just feel like that's for anyone that doesn't know, airdropping is a feature on a iPhone where iPhone users can basically just airdrop photos to other users. And some users don't have the their phone blocked i'm actually not an iphone user so i might be explaining it wrong but i'm just explaining to any uh listeners that don't know what airdropping means um but yeah i think most people know what it means but basically it's like you could just send photos right and so someone airdropped a gun and so it became a security threat and so it ended up being this whole debacle according to the article that they had to deplane. They had to interview this kid. He was not allowed back on the flight. Basically, they made everyone go back out through security, get rescreened. Like, it was a big shit show. So, yeah. Anyways, that, <laughs> I was like, man, I, you just never know. Honestly, you just never know. Everything could go right. You boarded your plane, imagine, and then that happened. You just never know. It's just crazy. All right. Up next, I have Delta Airlines is cutting routes amid pandemic era network rebuild. Also, Frontier is adding five new cities in 20 route expansion. So the reason why I have these two together is just because I think it's very interesting with COVID how these airlines are adapting. You see certain routes being taken away by certain carriers and you see more routes being added by other carriers. It's just very, very interesting depending on the carrier you work for or the carrier you fly. There's a lot of movement going on and there's a lot of things that are changing because um yeah you just you, we just don't know right everything is just like changing constantly with covid um but for the better i feel like all right up next i have one year later investigators release report about a potential serious incident between a united boeing 787-10 which is a dreamliner and an easyjet a320 which is an airbus at paris cdg airport all right, I'm not going to lie. This popped up in my Twitter feed, but you know how Twitter is, how, or if you don't know how Twitter is, basically, you can only say a short expert on the Twitter, on the tweet. And I actually thought this was like an incident that was happening currently. But luckily, people posted comments saying, hey, this happened in 2020, which even if it did happen in 2020, I didn't even know about it. Okay. So basically, um, yeah, basically what happened was, according to the article, there was an approach of a United flight, the Dreamliner, was approaching and was cleared to land on 09 left, or only two runways were open because it was during peak COVID. And there was a lot of factors that the investigation reported, basically, like the air traffic controller was sitting at a different computer screen than they normally would because of the computer malfunction. 
the United pilot didn't use the correct terminology when relaying back the runway to the air traffic controller. He said he or she, I don't know who it was, but he or she said something like, um, instead of saying confirm, they said understood and or whatever, something. They said something that was not what we would call standard operating procedures. So there's just a lot of things. And the Airbus basically warned the United plane to do a go around. And basically it was like almost a near it was almost a very major accident is what I got out of this article. But what's crazy to me is I don't ever remember even hearing about it. I think just because 2020 was so fucking hectic with COVID and protests and presidential election. Like I just feel like 2020 was so insane in the United States. I don't even remember, but it was basically a year ago that this happened and they just released the article. So if you're interested in that, go check it out. I thought it was really interesting to read about. Okay. Here's something else that's interesting that I saw via mix mag for the club scene. So not really aviation, but for any of my listeners that like to travel and go to clubs and see different cities, I thought this was really interesting. Or any of my flight attendants that go clubbing on layovers, you never know. Basically, I saw from mix mag that they that England is going to be making a covid vaccine passport mandatory for club entry in England as of September. So basically, you have to be vaccinated in order to go clubbing in England, which I thought was, wow, like, (laughs) we'll see how that goes over. All right. Up next, we have American Airlines is designing a new A321 XLR and a Boeing 787-9, which is a Dreamliner, um, with what looks like a full-size bed. Like, the picture looked like it was a full-size bed. It really reminds me of some Emirates. Emirates type of layout. So that's kind of cool. All right. KLM is catching some serious heat as more and more Olympic athletes test positive for COVID. So apparently several athletes all tested negative before boarding their aircraft to be transported to the Olympics, which is happening right now in Tokyo. And after they got off the aircraft, they were transported in their little quote unquote bubble, meaning like no one was supposed to be around them or whatever. And so no one could really figure out where they contracted the virus because then they tested positive for it. So, okay, this is so crazy. All right. So in the, in the latest statement, basically this is so crazy just because imagine working that hard, imagine training for years and years and the summer Olympics only comes what every few years. And then you're automatically disqualified because you have COVID like, dude, it's just insane to me. Okay. So anyway, in the latest statement, it seems like people assume that one of the crew members may have passed the virus along. And so po- spokesperson for the KLM airline said to a broadcaster, the Dutch government, and this is a quote, the Dutch government has Japan on a list of safe countries. So personnel do not have to be tested. Japan does require a temperature check before arrival and on departure. Crew members can stay in the country for a maximum of 72 hours. There has been no contamination in our crew. So this is completely true. It's for my company as well. There's certain international routes that you have to have a COVID test before you fly but there's certain ones where you do not. And then there's certain destinations where you have to stay quarantined in your room. And then there's certain ones where you don't. So everything's just moving parts here, but yeah, I just can't even imagine being these Olympic players and, you know, they were all flown on this aircraft and then basically like they all got wiped out by getting COVID. (laughs) Like it's just insane. All right. And lastly, I have pilots asked to conserve as Western airports run low on jet fuel. Western states in the United States may face delays as jet fuel shortages continue and may continue through mid-August. My camera just died on YouTube. (laughs) But basically, Western states in the U.S. may face delays as jet fuel shortages continue and may continue through mid-August. Smaller and mid-sized airports may be the most affected. So there's a lot of wildfires going on in Nevada, California, like there always is. And I think it's really affecting where the jet fuel deliveries are taking place and things like that. And so I thought that was like really interesting. Um, I hope that you know, these firefighters can be safe and get some of these fires out. But I just thought that was interesting. So if you plan on flying through any of the Western states, or if you're based out there, just expect delays is what I got from this article. All right, I will be right back. 
Whew. Okay. I feel like this episode was a little choppy. I'm a little rusty since I took a week off and had my puppy. I literally have her outside and I bet you she's like digging a hole in my garden and yeah, I'm sure it's not going to be pretty. So I got to run. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I really hope uh, you gained some confidence to go solo travel yourself. Feel free to DM me on Instagram at WT Flight Radio or at Living by the F Word on Instagram. It's at Living by the dot F Word. But if you search Living by the F Word, you will find me. Um, feel free to DM me. Feel free to email me if you want any advice, uh, if you need a confidence booster just go watch my YouTube video. I'm telling you, just do it. Plan that solo trip. You will learn so much about yourself. You will meet so many people. You will have an amazing time. Just do it. I'm going to run. I will see you in next week's episode. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.